Hello, and happy Thursday to everyone attending to uh, attending today's webcast, The Importance of Globally Curated Music Literature for Music Programs, uh, sponsored by EBSCO Host and Library Journal. I'm Steve Kempel, Music Reference Librarian at the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County, and I'll be moderator for today's webcast. Um, before we dive in, there are just a few housekeeping rules to run through. Uh, if you run into technical problems, you'll find a purple Q&A button on the audience console. Uh, just click it, and the webcast tech team will get to you as soon as possible. If your screen becomes locked due to local network congestion, try using F5 to refresh the webcast console. If you're on a Mac, use Command-R. I always thought Mac commands sound fun. Command R. Today's fabulous slide presentation is available for download in the green resources folder on the bottom menu dock. A certificate for continuing education credit is also available in the resources folder where it says certificate. And if you have any questions or comments, you can send those at any time during uh, via the purple Q&A box. And please join the conversation on Twitter. Tweet us at LJ Events with the hashtag LJ EBSCO. Now I'd like to introduce today's first speaker, H. Robert Cohen, founder and director of the Retrospective Index to Music Periodicals. Well, hello all. This is Robert Cohen, and thank you for your interest in this presentation today. In a word, let me tell you what RIPM does. We preserve and provide access to music periodicals published over a 200-year period, roughly 10 years after the death of Bach, to Bartok and Boulez, so from 1760 to 1966. It's a period of over 200 years that encompasses very, very rich periods in the history of music. And during this period, for reasons that we can't explain at this point, some 4,500 specialized music journals were published. And despite their obvious interest about which I'll talk today, few of them were available until the creation of RIPM in the 1980s. Now, I'd like to begin with some somewhat embarrassing slides by asking you to read reviews of RIPM. RIPM was uh, supported 20 years by the National Endowment for the Humanities and also for a number of years by the Mellon Foundation. <clears throat> and these are highly competitive grants. And these are some reviews representative of the manner in which reviewers for the NEH has thought of RIPM. Let me jump now to the International Press, Journal of the American Musicological Society, Times of London, the Bulletin de Bibliothèque de France and Il Giornale de la Musica. So RIPM has a very important place in preserving the musical history of Europe and the Americas. Now, what is RIPM? Well, it's the only internationally coordinated initiative created to preserve, reconstruct, and provide access to music periodical literature published from 1760 1966 in Europe and the Americas. We're a not-for-profit organization, primarily consisting of music librarians and uh, music historians, a publisher of publications, database provider to EBSCO, and an R project. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the R projects, an R, a repertoire, is created when the two international organizations in music, YAMO, International Association of Music Libraries and the International Musicological Society identify an area of a massive amount of documentary information that's simply not available. And they create an R or a repertoire to attempt to make it available to the world, in quotes. So what is RIPM? I think it's important to point out how international in scope this is given the title of the session. We function with collaborators in more than 20 countries and treat music periodicals published in more than 30 countries. Now, the names of the countries are listed here 
that these, those who collaborate, us, collaborate with us select the journals for treatment, they index the journals, they edit the data, and they participate in scanning and reconstructing the complete runs of journals. If we break down by language the treatment, 72% of the database is in English, French, German, Italian, and Spanish. But this has to do with the number of journals. While it initially appears that only 27, 28% are in English, a much larger portion of the database is in English because there are many very, very long journals and the number of citations when counted account for about 50% of the database. We have three principal publications, and I'll tell you why we do this in a moment. The Retrospective Index to Music Periodicals, in which 250 music periodicals are indexed. It's an online publication with 820,000 annotated citations. And until very recently, we also published in print. And our final volume was last year, and it was number 318. The retrospective index leads one naturally to the retrospective online archive. So we search in the index, and we move to the archive, and we see the full page displayed. Our third project is the Ripham eLibrary, which by the end of this year will contain 100 journals. And it's a supplement to the two other publications. And I'll explain that in a moment as we move forward. We're also working on a Ripham Jazz Periodicals project and perhaps at the end of the session, we may be able to return to discuss this a few minutes. So in, 1907, in 2017, uh, Ripon will provide cover-to-cover -cover access to 350 music periodicals, 251 with full text. And we do this in two different ways. There, <clears throat> excuse me. This is a page, uh, for, uh, an index we, in which we searched Aaron Copeland, and the results are you're familiar with it. It's, it's an EBSCO. Uh, EBSCO fields are returned. If you look in the upper right hand corner here, you see the title of the article. You see a square bracket here and here. All, almost all of our records are annotated to indicate their content. Otherwise, the content would hardly be recognizable, and you'll see why in a moment. The ROA symbol. In, the, in one of the fields indicates that the reference, the citation, is available in the archive, on the online archive. So one clicks on ROA and moves immediately from the reference or to the citation to the image. And if this image were text, text would be highlighted. Now we deal with large footprint journals, so we may have a journal that's two feet tall and 18 inches wide. So at times, it's very difficult to identify the location on the page that specifically refers to what you're looking for. For that reason, we highlight it. Now, I mentioned that we have a supplement to the index and the archive. And you might ask why. And there's a reasonable explanation for its creation. This is Musical America. This is one page in a journal titled Musical America. If you look at this page, You'll see it contains about 25 subjects, subject headings, titles on a given page. There are 80,000 pages in Musical America. So if we try to index this journal the way we do other journals, we would have to index, we would arrive to, have, we would end up having 2,400,000 annotated records. So that's three times the size of the annotated records currently in the index, which is already large with 800 and some thousand. Now, how does this work then? We had to confront the problem of dealing with journals that can't be indexed, and there are many of them. So we developed a system that tries to do the same thing and leads, hopefully, to the same result. Now, let's say for a moment here, we put in, you can't see, read this, I don't think, but it says Stravinsky Petrograd. And I put that in the field, in the subject field, keyword field, and selected Musical America. I then did a search. The result is this. The result tells you here that 18 pages contain this search term. Over here, it tells you that in this issue, there are 11 citations to that which you're searching. Now, you have a density button or a relevance button that you can press, and it will first display 
the highest number of hits. If you look at the bottom of this page, you'll see that the search terms are highlighted on the page. So here you have Igor Stravinsky, the ultra-modern Russian composer in his studio in Petrograd in 1916. So the goal is the same, to get you into the material and to that what you're looking for as quickly as possible. So we have four principal activities. We index, we scan, we develop software, and we reconstruct full runs of journals. The latter, well, all of them are immense tasks, but the latter is particularly particular to what we're doing because we're dealing with journals that are old, often in poor condition, and we often confront uh, problems that uh, are revealed in, in poor cataloging in libraries. We find that uh, a journal is listed as being in a library. We go to the library and we find, in effect, two issues of that journal with no indication of, of how much is there or isn't. Now, you might ask, and I asked in the previous slide, why in the heck should people bother doing this? There's a tremendous amount of work involving institutes, many, many institutions from here to Moscow, and a great effort on the part of all involved. Well, in the end, it's quite simple. Take a look at the artworks on the left, upper left-hand corner of the page. There are two. One you recognize, one you don't. You probably have a reaction to this. You, your emotions tell you, your aesthetic or your taste tells you, I like the Mona Lisa more than I like the drawing by Wolfgang Petrick, or I prefer the modern piece. You make that decision yourself. It's yours to make. And once you've made it, you can deduce what you want to do thereafter. You can study the Mona Lisa. You can call Petrick in Berlin. You can do whatever you want with the knowledge that you've made the choice. The same, same case is with literature. If you begin to read the collected short stories or fiction of Joseph Roth, and you compare that with the uh, interesting title of Vengeance by Hank Johnson, you'll again quickly come to a conclusion about what you prefer. It's up to you and the artwork. The same with architecture. You can bump into it, but you like it or you don't, and you can pursue your interest thereafter. Well, what happens with music? If I give you a piece of music, it generates a big question mark. Do you like it? Do you have any reaction to it? You don't know. So you'll say, well, I need to hear it. So you need something supplement, something to supplement your appreciation of that work to even begin to determine if it satisfies your interest or not. Well, only a very small portion of the world's music is recorded. So then what, you do, what do you do? Well, you go to the history books. But the history books were written without access to all this documentation. So it gives you a fairly distant view from the a period itself during which the work, during which the events were happening. One thing you might choose to do is turn your interest, look, take a look at the musical press, because the musical press is the remarkable documentary resource that offers a history of musical life in Europe and the Americas on almost a daily basis. It provides factual information. It tells you who played where, was it appreciated, and just about any other, uh, any other question you want to raise, you can answer with examining extensively the musical press. Now, this has been recognized since the 1930s. People have made several attempts to control and gain access to the musical press, but until Ripon was created in 1980, to resolve this, this impasse, it was virtually impossible to have extended access to almost any of this material. The reason for this is threefold. The copies of the journals are scattered throughout Europe and the Americas and are often very difficult to locate. And when you find them, they're often incomplete and at times in very poor condition. There's a lack of indexes. And finally, there are about 4,500 journals, which is really, they're really frightening to confront if you do so without bibliographical resources. Now, this is what happened to me and what happened to just about everyone that went off to Paris or Europe with a, with a dissertation topic. They got there and realized, my God, if I'm going to work on this topic and do it in a year, I won't succeed. I went with one topic. It would have taken me three lifetimes to achieve what I, what I needed to, what I set out as my project. Obviously, I changed it. But what happened was this material was left alone in large part 
because it was almost impossible to manage. And the typical scenario was either one sat and turned hundreds of thousands of pages each time one took on another research project, or one simply gave up and left the library. The physical condition of the journals. If we can find them, they're often, or at least at times, eaten by rodents, falling apart, pages are missing, bindings are cracked. So our principal task, one of the major tasks for us, is to digitize to the high, high archival standards all of this material. We have two permanent stations, one at the International Whitman Center in Baltimore. We've had a scanning station at the Library of Congress for many years, and that's quite a privilege. Um, I think we've been there now six or seven years. We also have a traveling machine, which we took to New York not too long ago, and one of our colleagues is in a little office in the New York Public Library scanning with our equipment. We also work with the Viennese organization, a nonprofit organization to scan for us, the Russell's Conservatory, and many other organizations on a piecemeal basis. Let me just give you some statistics, and then we'll go on to tell you what RIPM supplies. Statistics. If we add up the number of pages in the RIPM online archive and add those to the e-library when we update it with the 65 journals that are waiting in the wings, we will have over a million pages online of music periodicals. Now, to, get in, to begin to understand the magnitude of this, if we just search for reviews alone in our principal index, there are over 406,000 reviews. And if we're interested in biographical studies, there are over 83,000. So this resource becomes a principal documentary, almost encyclopedic manual of biographical information for some 200 years. Now, if you look at the number of citations, it's, it's fairly staggering. If you look at uh, Chimarosa, for example, or Bach, Ripham records, there are 8,307. But Bach's, the number of times Bach appears on a page in the e-library is 93,000 times. So you must use Boolean delimiters to focus your research. So for example, if I look, at, look up Shakespeare, I'll find between the citations and the page sightings 11,000 plus. But if I search for Shakespeare and Berlioz, I'll find something much more manageable, 543. So the number of citations should not be viewed as frightening but rather be viewed as something that you, you can manipulate and, and work with to lead you to the specific information that you want. So what does all this mean to you? Well, it means that we're providing primary source material, a million pages of it, in a manner that you can manipulate and discover and locate that which you're looking for. This is the core collection of this material selected by specialists, and supplying cover-to-cover -cover coverage of complete runs of music journals. Two, it's an almost daily chronicle of musical life, music and musical life, from 1760 to, to, to 1966. So let me draw a parallel. Let's assume that you see a home in front of you in a photograph, and you slice the home in the middle, and you turn it towards you in a cross-section, you will see that uh, there's a basement, activity there, activity on the first floor, in the toilets, in the bathrooms, in the living room, in the bedrooms, and in the attic. You're looking at four levels at the same time. Well, we can do that now with Ripham because we can cut a cross-section of musical life in 1875. What's going on in Vienna? What's going on in Paris? What happened during this week in Europe? We can trace the travels of musicians. We can follow the reception of their, their works. We can see how their works were influenced by the new environment in which they lived. So this daily chronicle is an encyclopedia of music. Now, RIPM is an essential complement to RILM, the Music Index, IIMP, Grove, and MGG, because it precedes them in large part chronologically. I'll just give one example. Joachim Raff, a lesser-known composer, has, is, uh, is identified in 879 records in ROI, the index. In the e-library, 
His name appears on 9,833 pages. Now, of course, history looks back at something. So it's quite understandable that you're going to have not that many references to Raff in contemporary literature. So there are 106 in Rillum, 95 in Grove, and in MGG only two citations are comparable with what we have. So the point is that when you look at the musical life of the time, as it was perceived by its contemporaries, it looks different. And it, it doesn't assure a quality judgment. It just can indicate whether this might be worth considering. And you can do that particularly with reviews, because there are over 400,000 reviews in Ripham. Ripham is also an important teaching tool in many institutions. And what we're finding more and more is that it's not only used in graduate teaching, it's also used in undergraduate teaching because faculty are finding that they can give third and fourth year students an assignment to do original research in English. They deal with the material, they're dealing with original source material, and they're drawing conclusions based on their research, not necessarily on what the textbook told them. Annotated records, I mentioned that. What's green is annotated. The title itself doesn't really reveal me very much. This is immense bibliography of music. There are hundreds of thousands of pieces uh, referred to in Ripham. And as, a, as an ex-clarinetist, I can tell you that most clarinetists are familiar with perhaps 20, 20 concertos at the most. If you look at Ripham and you look for concertos for clarinet, you'll find hundreds and hundreds. So it's a remarkable resource for exploring music that's not generally well known that may well be of interest. Now you might say, well, wait a moment. Part half of this is not in English. True. However, many thousands and thousands of articles have been translated during the time from German into English, from Italian into English. Uh, and when they were translated into English for an English uh, a GB, a great a Britain, British periodical, they were often recopied in America. So there are thousands and thousands of articles in English by the most well-known writers and about the most well-known artists and composers and performers of the period. Of course, when you have access to this material, it permits almost an endless research on an almost endless list of topics. Here are just a few. Frankly, I'm giving a paper, and, I, and it's called The Only Limit is One's Imagination, and I think that's the case. And here is a more detailed look at what it offers. So this concludes my 10 or 12 minute overview of Ripham, but I answer email. So if you do have a question that's not treated during the question and answer period, please send me an email and I'll be happy to reply. I can. I am H. Robert Cohen, C-O-H-E-N, H-R Cohen is my email address at R-I-P-M, Ripham.org. Thanks very much. All right, thank you so much, Robert. That was that was really great. Um, up next, we have Barbara Dobbs McKenzie, uh, who is the editor in chief at Repertoire International de Literature Musicale, or RILM, and she's going to talk to you about some great stuff as well. So, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to use this brief session to share with you the latest developments at RILM and show you how RILM can be most useful to 21st century music students, faculty, and other researchers by demonstrating RILM's current resource offerings and what you can expect to find in them. So let me start with a little bit of background, because knowing something about RILM's founding and history explains a lot about what RILM includes and how it's used today. RILM was founded in 1966 at the City University of New York, where we still are, by the way, by the renowned musicologist Barry S. Brooke, with a mission to abstract and index music and music-related research from all around the world. In other words, RILM was to be a tool providing total bibliographic control over the world's research on music. Now, that's a huge mission, as you can imagine, total bibliographic control over the world's research on music. 
Um, and that remains Realm Abstract's mission to this day, exactly the same as when Brooke founded it in the 60s, with the crucial difference that while the ultimate goal of complete global coverage remains elusive and always will remain elusive, we strive to get ever closer to achieving it each year. Realm functions under the auspices of the three large international scholarly societies for music, as you see on this slide, representing music librarians, traditional and popular music scholars, and historical and art, art music scholars. So Realm Abstracts is what Realm produced for the first 50 years of its existence. It's the sole resource we focused on and provided to the academic music community. And through these decades, Realm was and still is always pushing the boundaries of what coverage to include. We want to include more and more countries, more and more document types, more and more languages, and more and more sub-disciplines of music. One of the ways we do this is through our large network of national realm committees, now in almost 50 countries around the world. These committees are responsible for submitting abstracts and citations of all works published in their countries that meet realm scope guidelines. And all of these committees contribute these records to the database at the Realm International Center here in New York, where we have a team of some 40 staff members, most of whom are editors and assistant editors, and most with PhDs in music. And here we check the data, we edit and index it, and we translate it where needed and publish it online through EBSCO, and fill in the gaps that are not covered by our committees. We apply the deep expertise of our staff in our editorial and, and indexing practices. They're very well qualified to get at the central concepts of the literature that we're indexing, and index it according to the evolving disciplines of music research, applying their knowledge to ensure that students and faculty and other researchers can find all that they're looking for. This international uh, committee structure and the professional expertise of our staff have been a huge advantage to Realm Abstracts over the years, and the results are summarized in the next few slides. So on this slide, you see all the document types that are covered by, by Realm uh, Abstracts. Uh, most ANI, Abstract and Indexing Services, do only journal articles. As you can see from this list of document types, Realm does all document types. We don't really care the, the media in which research is published. If it's music research, we try to capture it in Realm Abstracts. And then you can see the, the areas of music scholarship we cover. We really try very hard to cover all of music and even music-related topics. So you might think of Bach and, and Mozart with Realm, but do you also think of um, Prince or David Bowie or Carpal Tunnel Syndrome and Violin Players or um, music therapy, uh, music librarianship, uh, et cetera? We try to cover all of that. And this slide uh, sort of reinforces that, because one of the most important areas of music research and for some years now is interdisciplinary research. And interdisciplinary publications can be particularly hard to track down, because they're not in music journals or a, a book of uh, music essays. They're mixed up with other things that might be primarily on another discipline's topics. So Realm makes a special effort to try to track those interdisciplinary topics, articles, and books, and book chapters down and included in our index. So here are just some statistics to show where Realm Abstracts is today. We have nearly a million records from over 150 countries and 174 languages. And we add about 50,000 new records to the database every year now. All of our abstracts are in English, and all titles are translated into English. And by the way, all of our indexing is in English. And increasingly, we add a second abstract in the language of the publication. Um, there are, of course, links to full text online publications, and I'll say more about that in a moment. And we do article level indexing for collections. Um, now Realm Abstracts is searched well over 2 million times every week around the world. So in part, uh, inspired by our then approaching 50th anniversary, Realm became even more ambitious. And we decided to expand according to what researchers, music researchers were, were asking for in order to meet their needs better with new resources. 
And as you may be able to guess, the next logical step for Rilm's large and comprehensive bibliography was the addition of full text content, enabling users to click right from the bibliographic citation or abstract directly to the full text itself. Hence the birth of Rilm Abstracts with Full Text, sometimes referred to by its acronym RAFT. Realm Abstracts with Full Text, or RAFT, was launched just seven months ago, and this slide provides an overview of the full text content of RAFT at the time of launch. So it covered periodicals in 45 countries and 36 languages, 214 periodical titles altogether, and we had at that moment 80, just over 89,000 records at launch. You can see that international coverage has always been a hallmark of what Realm does and that this focus continues with our new resources. The collection is building month by month until it reaches completion, at which point we expect it to include 240 journals, mostly in complete journal runs, and some 200,000 records. Most of the titles are not found in any other aggregation, and about 25% of the journals included have never been in digital form before. One of the main criteria for choosing the titles in the collection was our effort to ensure representation of a broad, as broad a range as possible of music research topics, as you can see from the last bullet point on this uh, slide, going from historical musicology to the blues to recorded music and much more. This uh, slide shows the distribution of the full text content by country of publication. And while English articles constitute the largest segment of RAFT, you can see the United States and Great Britain there as the largest segment together. The distribution reflects again Rome's international focus. You see that other is quite large because there's a lot of journals, but very few from a number of uh, other countries. This slide also shows the international coverage. This is by language rather than by country of publication. And again, English is by far the largest, the preponderance of the content, but we have many, many other languages as well. The next two slides, I'm simply, I'm going to show you simply to give you a snapshot of two specific areas to give you just a flavor of the breadth of the collection. This slide provides a slice of RAFT content from a national perspective. So here, RAFT includes, shows that it includes the content of all of the major music research journals published in Brazil, which provides excellent coverage of all topics of research that are going on in Brazil, including Brazilian popular music, traditional music, art music, instruments, and much more. And this slide, on the other hand, shows a slice from a subject point of view versus a national point of view. And here um, the topic is, of course, popular music. The content of these core popular music journals are all included in our full text collection in RAFT. This uh, is a screenshot, albeit small. I realize you can't really read this. Um, but this is a screenshot of the RAFT page on the Realm website. You can see the URL above the image quite clearly, realm.org slash full text. And you might want to, if you're interested in this collection, you might want to visit this page because it shows you the exact content of the collection at the present moment. So here you can see every journal that's in the collection as it currently stands and you can either put a title in the search box near the bottom of this screen and hit search to see if that title is included in our full text, or you can simply hit show all journals at the bottom and get a list of all the journals in the collection. And once you have a journal title up, you can click on that title and it will tell you exactly which issues are currently in the collection. And of course, this changes month to month as we update it and increase the collection. But if you want to know what's there right now, you can always go to this page and find out. Realm also added uh, a third um, resource to our offerings through EBSCO, and one that EBSCO also helped us to develop. We kept hearing from researchers and students that one area lacking in online music reference resources was digital music encyclopedias. 
As you may know, many music encyclopedias exist only in print, including both heavily used encyclopedias and others that are only consulted for a particular topic once in a while. Historical and contemporary encyclopedias both fall into each of those two categories. And when they're only in print, many details buried in the articles can be difficult to unearth. So with this in mind, we developed Real Music Encyclopedias, which is a full-text growing aggregation of music encyclopedia content launched by Realm just in December of 2015, so 13 months ago. When the collection was launched, it included 41 music encyclopedias and about 170 encyclopedic entries. And it covers publications, encyclopedias that were published as far back as the 18th century and up until the present. One of the hallmarks of this collection are the new titles that are added every year. In fact, this month, four new titles have been added for 2017. So now the collection is up to 45 music encyclopedias. Most of the content of real music encyclopedias is not available anywhere else online. And again, as you, can, as you will see even more in the next couple of slides, real maintains its international focus in this resource as well. The encyclopedia entries in the collection cover people in music, so biographies, as well as a very wide range of, of subjects, as you can see from this only partial list on the slide. And I chose this list just because it shows some, some depth. It's not in any way comprehensive. As with all things Realm, this is a multilingual collection that is easily cross-searchable thanks to Realm's equivalencies, which run in the background. And we add equivalencies on a regular basis. So these elements are becoming more and more robust over time to include more and more terms and languages. And so searching improves um, as we add those things over time. The collection includes important national and regional music topics, um, so, so uh, encyclopedias that are focused nationally or regionally or, or subject specific, as uh, these examples are indications of. And we also include a number of broad general music encyclopedias, like the ones listed here. Note that the last title on this list, which translates as contemporary composers, Komponisten der Gegenwart, um, is an ever-expanding encyclopedia that includes Bio biographical entries on modern composers. And the content is added to this encyclopedia every quarter or so. So it remains quite up to date. Uh, so for 50 years, Realm produced only Realm abstracts of music literature. And in the last 13 months, we have added two new resources aimed at ser serving music researchers in the 21st century. So um, Realm has expanded and increased quite a lot, and we believe that the resources we're adding to our offerings um, will be of great interest to students and faculty and any music researchers. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Barbara. That was really terrific. Um, up next. Uh, last but not least is Ryan Bernier, who is the Vice President of um, Database Partnerships at EBSCO Information Services. And here he is. Thank you, Steve, and thanks, Barbara and Robert, and, and really to everyone for attending. Um, I certainly understand, and we all do, that your time is valuable and that there are a lot of things you could be doing with this hour. So thank you for spending it with us. Um, I'm personally truly delighted to be included in this session with Barbara and Robert. Um, they're certainly highly regarded in this discipline and carry many accolades, and um, we've worked together for uh, somewhere near 10 years, I believe, and have certainly learned a lot and always enjoy our discussions and working together um, you know, towards a common goal, which is disseminating knowledge and advancing music scholarship. Before I begin my piece here, um, I would like to take a moment to recognize H. Robert Cohen of Ripham, who, who spoke first here, uh, who will be named honorary member of the International Musicological Society this spring. So congratulations, Robert. It is a big honor, and um, 
the IMS Congress actually takes place in March in Tokyo, and I know folks from our three organizations will certainly be present. Um, and we also look forward to seeing you hopefully out there at some of the other key conferences here um, coming up uh, in February in Orlando. We have the MLA conference, and as well as the um, the YAML conference, IAML, at the National Library of Latvia in June. So with that, I would like to move along. Um, so I put here that EBSCO is a leading provider of information of music research, and why I, why I have that there is, you know, we, we do certainly talk with colleges, um, universities, public libraries, all sorts of different institutions regularly, and um, we understand the needs, and we're trying to really make sure that we have comprehensive solutions on our platform for, that cover not only different genres and time periods, but also lots of different document types. And so we've been working for a while with key partners, such as Realm and Ripem and some others, uh, we'll look at really to make sure that we can offer a comprehensive solution and, and limit the gaps um, in content that's out there. So I wanted to start just by showing a list of all the different resources that are available from uh, with partnerships with, with content providers as well as some of the products that are um, EBSCO owned. And this list is, is fairly long. Um, we've really put a lot of effort into establishing um, different resources in this discipline. If you look across all of EBSCO's products, we, we have, I would say, confidently, the most databases in this particular discipline uh, because there's just so much out there and there are so many providers doing great work. Um, so another nice thing is as you look at this slide, uh, of about 10 or 11 different products. Four or five of these did not exist five years ago. So there's a lot of new content that's coming out and a lot of new resources that are available in the market now. Um, I did want to mention, because um, they are not represented on this particular session today, um, outside of Realm and Ripem, um, we also offer the RISM series database um, and as well as the index to printed music, which I know a lot of you are familiar with. The last two mentioned here um, are EBSCO databases, the International Bibliography of Theater and Dance with Full Text, as well as Music Index. Um, and I will be focusing a little bit more towards Music Index because it's a, it's a wonderful fit for this particular talk. Um, this slide here, as well as the next one, is really showing the, the different record types that are available. Um, a lot of times when you think about databases, you're thinking about indexing and abstracting, and you're thinking about full text journal content. Um, but really, you know, this sort of runs the gamut. So um, across all the different databases on the platform, um, we're touching on manuscripts, uh, Barbara mentioned encyclopedias, uh, sheet music, and obviously, as uh, hopefully we're getting the point across today, that there are many different time periods lots of different regions, and lots of international content. This slide is a bit busy, um, but really sh trying to show the, the overall music sphere here. And uh, if you look down the left-hand column, you can see that uh, the time span, so really going back from Greek times all the way up to present and everything in between, um, and really by database showing you the coverage period, the type of music, um, document types that are available, um, the database, the con that the content is global in all of these resources, and then also at the end showing uh, which publishers are producing this content. Um, again, it's a busy slide, I know that, but all of this will be available to you after the presentation is over. Okay, so um, on the EBSCO platform, we really go beyond databases. Uh, I know that's kind of been the focus of the talk so far, but I did want to mention a couple of other, uh, uh, you know, uh, content types that we have available. And one is eBooks. So EBSCO has been focusing a lot on eBooks for the last five years or so. Um, we've developed close to, uh, an eBook platform, which many of you um, are, are familiar with. And but just wanted to point out that we've got over 7,500 eBooks. Um, in this particular discipline, you know, in, in the in the music resources, 
and um, a lot of them are from very notable publishers. Um, so this all works well. This all can be searched together with your RILM and your RIPM and your Music Index databases. Um, a little bit more on eBooks. So of course, eBooks can be purchased individually and buy one title. Uh, but we also wanted to make them available in some collections. So really two key collections I wanted to focus on. One is our academic collection. And this has, um, it's an annual subscription product. It has 2,300 music and music research ebooks in one database. Um, the nice thing about this is that if you were to add up all the titles in this collection, you're looking at well over $100,000. Uh, you know, based on the list price. But as you might imagine, an annual subscription is extremely affordable and just a, a fraction of that price. Um, so it's a, it's a nice package, and it is updated um, throughout the year. And obviously, institutions that subscribe are not charged for any additional content that's added. Um, but there are things such as conducting and classical music, and just general information about musicians, all sorts of different uh, e-books there in that collection. Another nice thing is the music subject set. The subject sets are something that Net Library had started way back when, um, prior to EBSCO acquiring, um, you know, that that those particular titles, and it's worked out really well, and we've kept it. So every year we release a new subject set of anywhere from 15 to about 30 titles, and it's new eBooks. And the nice thing here is that they're an ownership model. And each year, the music subject set collection um, is, is totally new ebooks, so there's no overlap there. Um, I've looked at the attendee list here, and um, I know that many of you are familiar with EBSCO Discovery Service. And I um, just wanted to mention here, this is another nice way where we can bring additional music resources onto our platform. Um, the products listed here are not you know, databases that EBSCO offers to libraries. They're not for sale, if you will, through EBSCO. But we work with these different providers, and what we're doing is we're, we're indexing the, their full text content. We're including it within the base index of EBSCO Discovery Service and providing those index records to you in the result list. And if your institution has access to these titles, we can provide that linking from the index record within EBSCO Discovery Service over to the publisher's platform, and it's one-click seamless access. So really it opens up a number of additional resources on top of uh, everything I mentioned a few slides earlier. Of course, it's for mutual customers, so none of this, ac none of this content is available without a subscription. I mentioned linking, um, and I don't have any particular slides on this, but I just wanted to set this here to remind myself that there's, uh, it's really a strength of our platform, and really I think something our partners really enjoy when working with EBSCO um, is providing that high-quality indexing, obviously, but then getting users from the index to full text, whether that is the full text that resides in another EBSCO database, for example, academic search, um, or full text that resides through an e-journal, or perhaps uh, just some, something you have in your local holdings. Um, or linking out to even other providers' platforms. Um, so linking is really key, and it's a great way to bring the index together with the full text, and it's, it's a wonderful, happy marriage for the different publishers that we work with, but also for end users. And we really do our best you know, with smart linking, which is EBSCO's sort of proprietary linking software, to make it accurate 100% of the time. So if you're linking from an index on EBSCO host over to a full text record on another EBSCO product, you have that, you know, you know that when you click it, you're going to get to that full text. There's no, there's not going to be any intermediary screen that makes you, uh, that gives you choices. It's never going to say, sorry, you need to re-authenticate. Um, so it's really nice. And we can provide these lists if you're interested. But linking from, uh, for instance, Realm Abstracts or Ripem Index or Music Index over to full text content. This full text content would be in addition to the full text content that's included in the product. So, for example, this would be above and beyond what's included in Raft. 
I want to focus a little bit on Music Index with the time I have left. Um, it's a product that we're proud to continue to produce, and for those of you that aren't familiar, I wanted to give a brief history. Uh, so the Music Index Online was produced by Harmony Park Press. It was first published in print in the late 1940s. Um, by 1991, it moved over to CD-ROM and um, really reached a new level there and first appeared on online in 1999. So 50 years after it was produced, it was available online. Um, we partnered with Music Index and released the EBSCO host version in 2006. Um, and eventually ended up acquiring the Music Index in 2010. Um, and I wanted to a lot of, get this question a lot is, how did that come about? Um, and thought I would take a moment to explain that. Really, as hopefully it's been made very apparent, we've, we've, been, in, we've been investing in the discipline, and we thought this particular product would be a great fit. Um, there was a lot of criticism of Music Index in the market, for those of you that were familiar with it, you know, if you're looking back a decade or so. Um, it, it was, it, it took time and it was slow to update the product, so there was a lot of frustration there, and we felt that as a provider of the content. Um, currency plagued the database, a lack of currency, I should say, and the platform that it was on was, was difficult to navigate. Um, and limited, limited searching options. So really, we saw an opportunity here to improve the product by um, using our sort of indexing and taxonomy experts to help with strengthening the indexing, to make sure that the product was current and reliable so that subscribers you know, had that satisfaction. Um, and obviously, lots of different searching possibilities and browsing and navigation um, with the move over to EBSCOhost. So I also mentioned the full text linking, which was another, another um, wonderful feature, I'll say, and getting that ANI only database um, to a new height by having it be able to link over to full text. And I mentioned our taxonomy team um, and indexers, but wanted to let you know that because a, a lot of times we get the question, well, EBSCO, you're, you're a vendor. What, you, you own this index? Um, yeah, and, it, and we actually we own a lot of indexes, and we, we, we don't just acquire them and let them sit there. We, we have a team of 40 indexers in-house, uh, over half of them which have advanced degrees, 25% of them uh, formal musical training, uh, whether it be you know, vocal or instrumental training, we have 12 taxonomists in Ipswich, um, all with master's degrees and majority in library science. Uh, we have a music specialist on staff that's um, on the indexing and taxonomy team who also has a degree. So what I'm getting at here is that we, we have people in place that are dedicated to, to make sure that the quality that was, that was there continues on. Um, so let me move along now. So I'm approaching time. Music index content, um, quickly, 1970 to present, two and a half million records as of this January, and really covers, covers every aspect of classical and popular worlds of music. It's uh, certainly a bit more uh, modern product than what you're seeing with Rip'em. It's more in line with Realm, but we have a relationship with, with Realm where these products are extremely complementary, um, and I want to uh, I'll share a little bit more on that in a minute. I um, wanted to just mention that there is certainly a strong foreign language content focus. There are countries, uh, there are titles from 45 different countries. So the last couple of slides I wanted to mention some new products that are coming and we're all excited about here. One is Rip'em Index with full text. So we just heard a lot about Rip'em Index. We heard a lot about Rip'em Online Archive. Those products reside on two separate platforms today. Um, and what we're doing is we're, build, we're taking the Rip'em Index that's on EBSCO host today um, and also Rip'em Online Archive that is through the Rip'em Plus platform and we're creating a Rip'em Index with full text that will be available on the EBSCO host platform. Um, it's going to have 
indexing tied to 250 music periodicals. So Robert earlier had showed that link from the RIPM index on EBSCOhost, and then there was the ROA little logo in maroon that you could click on, and it would take you off to the archive. Everything will now be in one place within one interface. So it's a great user, uh, a really nice user experience and a growing collection of titles. This product is due to be released this spring, so please be on the lookout for more information there. Um, another new product that will be coming out later this year is Music Index Retrospective. So I mentioned that Music Index is 1970 to present. So this is everything that was indexed from 1949 when the print first came out right up until 1969. Um, the nice thing or unique thing about this is that this database will be for perpetual purchase. Um, so it's a one-time ownership, and you get to own it forever, and EBSCO will host it for you. The last new database I wanted to mention is Music Index with Full Text. Um, this is everything we had just talked about with Music Index, plus 100 or so, hopefully more. Um, we haven't finished building the product yet, but it's looking at 100-plus titles that will be included cover to cover full text, every article, every issue. Again, we've worked extremely closely with Realm to develop a product that is unique. And by unique, I mean there will be absolutely no overlap between Realm Abstracts with full text and Music Index with full text. So truly complementary databases. Um, so I urge you to take a look at this one when it comes out. Don't have an exact date, but we're getting close. We're looking at sometime later this calendar year. So I am going to end there. I'm going to pass it back over to Steve. I thank you for your time, and um, I think we're going to move on to any Q&A. So thanks again. All right, thank you so much, Ryan. That was uh, that was really great. Um, we're getting close to the time mark, um, but we do have a couple of questions. So if you guys all want to stick around, um, one uh, member of the audience asks um, to Ryan. Um, is any of the RIPA or Realm content included in EBSCOhost? Yes, thank you. Um, we offer currently RIPA index uh, on the EBSCOhost platform, and as I mentioned, in the near future, we'll have RIPA index with full text on the EBSCOhost platform. Um, as far as Realm goes, yes, all of the databases that that Barbara had discussed, the four Realm products are all available through EBSCOhost. Um, and in addition, anything that is on EBSCOhost can be multi-database search or what we call infused with EBSCO Discovery Service. So all of that content can be searchable through one search box within EBSCO Discovery Service. Awesome. I think we uh, have just enough time to squeeze a few more in. Um, Here's one that was for Barbara, um, and this audience member asked, how much new or updated content is added to the Real Music Encyclopedia each year? Great question. So um, every year it's our goal to add a handful of new titles. So I mentioned that there are four new titles that were just added in January, um, this month in other words. And you can find those titles on our website if you want to know the details. They're really important encyclopedias, all of them. Um, and we will do, do something like that, three to five, three to six new encyclopedias added to the collection in the early part of every uh, calendar year. In the, in, as well as that, uh, I mentioned that Koponisen de Gegenwart is actually updated on a quarterly basis because they add content uh, on, a, on a regular basis to that resource. Um, and there's another one that we're thinking of adding that will also uh, be updated on a regular basis. Uh, but primarily, it's the addition of new titles every year. Oh, great. Thanks, Barbara. Um, just, how about just one more question? Um, this one for Robert. Um, does RIPM foresee or is RIPM planning new electronic publications? And how often are its current publications updated? Well, all of our publications are updated with new titles, new journals every six months. So we add new, t new index 
uh, titles to the retrospective index. We have new full text titles, and we add new titles to the e-library, but we have 65 that are waiting to go into the e-library right now. I think what's very exciting about the future is that uh, Ripham signed an agreement with the Institute of Jazz Studies of Rutgers University, which has the largest collection of music periodicals in the world. And we are in the process of preparing a 100 titled full text searchable collection of jazz periodicals. And just some of the names are music to my ears a Clef, Cat's Meow, Jazz Report, Floy, Floy, Jazz Notes, Jazz Jam Session. And this is simply not available anywhere. Uh, again, we're piecing pieces together, and this is a collection that any institution that has any interest in jazz, including public libraries, I think will find this really a passionate uh, addition to their collection. All right. Well, I think that about does it for today. Uh, thank you, Robert, Ryan, and Barbara. You guys uh, all gave really amazing presentations, and everyone in the audience, if you see these guys at a conference or, or I don't know, at Fazoli's or something, do give them a high five um, because they're all doing awesome work. And um, finally, uh, if you enjoyed this webcast, please make sure to visit www.lj.com slash webcasts for more information. And thank you, everyone, for um, attending today. Um, this webcast will be archived in approximately one week, and we'll send you an email to tell you when it's available. Uh, you can find this webcast and other ar archived and forthcoming webcasts at, as I said, www.lj.com slash webcast. All righty. Thank you so much. Thank you.